most of us have attempted to deal with our anxiety through a variety of techniques, whether that it be avoidance, suppression, medication, meditation, whatever tools or techniques you may have come across that you thought might help you to manage your anxiety going forward. But this variety of management solutions <laughs> often creates more confusion than anything else and leaves you wondering where to go next, what to do next to get through the next day. Today we are going to identify the seven tiers of anxiety management. These are the tools, tricks, tips, techniques, even overall life changes that we may undertake to help us manage our anxiety and live a better life. I hope you'll stick around and join us. Hello there. My name is Dee and this is Easing Anxiety. If you like what we do, please subscribe and click on the notifications button so you can be alerted when new videos are available. Thanks for joining us. Hello there, I'm D, as I just mentioned in the introduction. <laughs> if you're new to Easing Anxiety, thanks for checking out our videos. I'm really glad you're here, and I hope you'll check out more of them, and even comment and let me know what you think. And if you're a veteran of Easing Anxiety, now I say veteran loosely because we've only been around for about a month, so it's not that you've been watching our videos for too long. But if you are a veteran of Easing Anxiety, welcome back. And if you've seen some of our other videos, you will have noticed that our look and feel may have changed a bit. That's because I finally got around to creating a new design and including a new logo. In fact, I'll put the logo right here. See, that's our new logo. And you have noticed in the introduction, things look a little different. Let me know what you think. I'm curious to have your feedback. You know, one of the books that I came across when I was doing my research um, was titled My Age of Anxiety, Fear, Hope, Dread, and the Search for Peace of Mind by Scott Stossel. Here it is. See how convenient that was? It was just in my hand. How did that happen? <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Um, anyway, I really enjoyed that book. And if you're looking for a good read and to learn some things about anxiety and learn some coping skills, hey, I recommend that book. But the reason I mention it today was in the opening of that book, Scott actually used a quote from Soren Kierkegaard back in 1844 from his work, Concept of Anxiety. And I wanted to share that here in this opening because this quote, I believe, described anxiety better than anything else I've read anywhere. And no grand inquisitor has such dreadful torments in readiness as anxiety has. And no secret agent knows as cunningly as anxiety how to attack his suspect in his weakest moment, or to make alluring the trap in which he will be caught. And no discerning judge understands how to interrogate and examine the accused, as does anxiety, which never lets the accused escape, neither through amusement, nor by noise, nor during work, neither by day, nor by night. Now, I've used that quote in the Benzo Free podcast a few times and even wrote it in my book because it's one that I really felt described what we go through, an experience that so many of us have trouble explaining to others who don't experience chronic anxiety like we do. To sum up what Kierkegaard just said, anxiety sucks. <laughs> That's the best way I know to describe it. It sucks, but it's not hopeless. And there's a lot of things that we can do, tools to utilize, techniques to employ, to help us manage and get through and live a full, exciting, joyful life, even with our anxiety. Thus, today, we are going to focus on something I call the seven tiers of anxiety management. Now, as I mentioned in the intro, some of these are quite effective and some of these can be destructive. And we'll talk about that as we go through each one. I've listed these as tiers in a certain order, but that doesn't necessarily mean that's how people experience them. Some may take them in different orders. Some may skip a tier or two. This is not necessarily a progression. So enough of the long intro. Let's take a look at the first one. The first tier is avoidance. Avoidance is the most common technique for managing anxiety in use today. Why? <laughs> because it works at least in the short term. The theory here is that if you can avoid the things that trigger anxiety, then you can avoid anxiety and live a happier life. That's the theory, <laughs> at least. Now let's break this down. 
There are three types of avoidance, and they are evasion, distraction, and suppression. Now, evasion is the most obvious. If something has triggered us in the past, we evade it. We avoid it. We, we keep away from it. A perfect example of this is for those who suffer from agoraphobia or other social phobias and avoid leaving their homes as much as possible. That the pain of this type of anxiety is just too much to bear. Another common one is acrophobia, a fear of heights. This is one of mine. I have a moderate fear of heights. I don't spend my weekends parachuting, bungee jumping, or even rock climbing. I, I keep away from those situations that might trigger that fear. Distraction is the second type of avoidance. Once we do get triggered, we may try to change the subject. We try and find something else to focus on. We busy ourselves with something more calming and avoid thinking about the topic that triggered the fear. This technique can be effective and can keep us above the fear for a while, but it can also lead to our third form of avoidance, and that is suppression. Suppression is very similar to distraction. It's another form of blocking, of preventing the processing of the emotions tied to the experience. We shove our emotions inside, deep inside, so we don't have to deal with them. Now, these three forms of avoidance can be quite helpful, especially in the short term. But in the long run, they can be more destructive than constructive. Emotions that are linked to these experiences in our lives don't just go away. They need to be processed. And if they aren't processed now, they will be processed later. And they will eat at you bit by bit until the time when they are finally released and you are forced to face them head on. And trust me, it may not be pretty. Avoidance can provide short-term gains, especially if you're under extreme distress. But it's not a long-term solution. Living your life avoiding life isn't really living at all. Our second tier is substance use and abuse. Many of us have found some relief from our anxiety from substances, whether it be alcohol, probably the most common one, but also cannabis or marijuana, or harder drugs like cocaine. Anything that provides you an escape from your anxiety can be very tempting in stressful times. Much like avoidance, these so-called solutions can provide short-term relief from our anxiety, but as we all know, over time, they can become dangerous, can cause severe problems like addiction, and can even be deadly for some. Addiction is a significant problem in the world today and one we should all be educated on. So as for the pros and cons on this one, well, this is of debate <laughs> and somewhat controversial at times, so I'm not about to really choose sides here. Is moderate drinking or even occasional cannabis use okay? <laughs> That's up to you. I am not about to say what is right or wrong, and I'm not about to lecture. I have an occasional drink now and then. I enjoy a good beer, margarita, or even glass of red wine. But for some people, it's not okay. One drink for an alcoholic can send them into a tailspin. And some substances, especially the harder drugs like meth, cocaine, heroin, opioids, can lead to addiction even in people who've never had problems with addiction in their past. So while using substances to help you cope with your anxiety may provide relief initially, the long-term consequences can be quite severe, even deadly for some. The third tier is diet and exercise. Now this one seems quite simple and actually, well, it is. <laughs> I'm not even going to spend a lot of time on it. The simple rule here is eat a healthy diet, get daily exercise, and drink plenty of fluids, water being the best. When it comes to diet and exercise, it doesn't have to be anything extreme. Be careful of fad diets, because most of them are just that, fads. Eating a healthy, well-balanced diet, rich in a good source of protein, whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, while avoiding most simple carbohydrates such as many processed foods can go a long way in providing the nutrition your body needs. Now, certain foods and drinks you might want to limit because they can trigger or complicate your anxiety, like caffeine, alcohol, or excessive sugar. And as for exercise, here you also don't need to be extreme. 
It doesn't have to be five hour-long spin classes each week or training for the next triathlon. Those things can be great if that is your passion. But most health benefits come from moderate, frequent exercise. Just taking a brisk 30-minute walk each day does wonders for your body and your mind. Get up from your desk once every hour just to stretch your legs some. The pros and cons here, well, the pros are obvious. I think I just mentioned them. The cons, well, it takes work. It takes time. And it takes discipline. So it can be hard. But the benefits are worth it. The fourth tier is anxiety tools. Now this list is endless. It includes tips, tricks, tools, techniques, anything else starting with a T. <laughs> I'm just joking. But the list goes on and on. There are so many possibilities. Some, like simple breathing techniques, are very basic and easy to start and quick to provide benefits. Others, like meditation, yoga, martial arts, can take time to learn, but whose benefits can be life-changing in the long run. These management tools come in all shapes and sizes, such as Spending time in nature, singing, dancing, socializing, volunteering and helping others, spending time with your pet, reading, drawing, painting, doing jigsaw puzzles, laughing, loving, huga for those Scandinavian fans out there like me, and hundreds, even thousands more, some of which we will cover in upcoming video. Some of these techniques work in some situations. Some work in others. I often talk about having your tool belt, your anxiety tool belt, with all kinds of tools for different situations. Let's face it, if you need a Phillips head screwdriver and all you have is a flathead, it doesn't work as well. And vice versa. The same for anxiety tools. Some work in some situations. Others work better in other situations. As for the pros and cons here, well, as you can tell, I don't have a lot of cons here. That's because you get to pick and choose the tools that work for you. Developing your anxiety tool belt will take some time. But even if you can find just one tool that helps you, isn't it worth it? The fifth tier is counseling and therapy. I've been in and out of counseling my whole life, and I'm not afraid to say so. I suffer from anxiety. It's not a weakness. It's just something I have and something that I need help with now and then to manage. Counseling and therapy varies greatly depending on the provider and the method or technique he or she employs. There's DBT, ACT, MBCT, MET, EMDR, CRA, IPT, FFT, and the list goes on and on. Even the U.S. military believes in counseling and therapy. The Veterans Administration and the U.S. Department of Defense recommend evidence-based psychotherapeutic interventions for their veterans with PTSD. Now, one of the most common forms of treatment for anxiety and therapy is CBT, Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. CBT has been shown time and time again to be one of the most successful types of treatments for those who suffer from GAD, or Generalized Anxiety Disorder. In many of these studies, CBT has been found as effective, if not more effective, in some circumstances, as medication. Well, as for the pros and cons, well, the cons? Counseling can take time, and its effectiveness can be based on the patient, the provider, and many other factors. It can also become quite expensive. And as for the pros, well, counseling has a long track record of success. In fact, CBT alone is one of the most evaluated and proven techniques for managing anxiety. If you decide to seek counseling to help with your anxiety, in my opinion, the most important step is to find the right counselor, the right therapist. Find someone who will work with you, who you feel comfortable with, who you will open up to, but who will also challenge you to improve and get better. It might take several tries for you to find the right therapist to work with you, but that's okay. This is a long-term relationship, and it's worth getting it right. The sixth tier is medication. Now, I gotta admit right up front, this one is right in my wheelhouse, and I might even be a bit biased, but I try hard not to be. 
You see, I spent several years researching and writing a book on anti-anxiety medications. And I also took an anti-anxiety medication as prescribed for 12 years and then spent several years recovering and coming off the medication and dealing with its complications. So I've had a bad experience with them. I do not believe that these medications should be banned, not in the least. Some are quite effective, some are not, and some are just overprescribed, in my opinion. Now, there are several classes of medications used commonly to treat anxiety. The first and most popular of these is benzodiazepines. Benzodiazepines, or benzos as they're commonly called, are the most common of all anti-anxiety drugs. They include Xanax, Ativan, Clonopin, Valium, Librium, and many others. How popular are these? Well, in 1969, Librium was the first benzo to be released to the public, and it quickly became the most popular drug in America. It was soon replaced by Valium, another benzodiazepine. Between 1969 and 1982, Valium was the top-selling drug in the U.S. And then in 1986, Xanax outdid all the others before it and became the best-selling drug in history at the time. In 2014, the demand for general anxiety medications was valued at $3.2 billion and continues to grow every year. So all that just to say, benzodiazepines are quite popular. <laughs> Let's take a look at the second group, and these are non-benzodiazepines, or Z drugs, as they're commonly called. Z drugs are often prescribed for anxiety and even more often for insomnia. Z drugs have a completely different chemical makeup as benzodiazepines, yet they seem to have similar side effects and long-term complications. These include brand names such as Ambien, Lunesta, Sonata, and others. The third class of drugs I'm just going to mention briefly here for treating anxiety are SSRIs and SNRIs. Even though they are usually defined as antidepressants, they often are prescribed to help people deal with anxiety. And while there are other classes of drugs that are used to help treat anxiety, we're just going to stop at those three today. Now, all of these drugs have had some success, especially in the short term, and it all makes sense. You feel anxious, you just pop a pill, right? <laughs> feel a little bit more relaxed. What could be simpler? And most of the time, when taken short-term or periodically, and not combined with other drugs or alcohol, these drugs rarely have severe complications. But that's not how many people have taken these drugs, and this is where the complications come in. You see, I was on clonazepam, brand name clonopin, for 12 years as prescribed by my physician, and I became dependent. Now, one thing I do have to make clear here is that I was not addicted to these drugs. Physiological dependence is not addiction. Most people who suffer from benzodiazepine dependence are not addicted to the drugs. They do not crave the drugs as an addict would. And unfortunately, that misunderstanding creates confusion and leads to improper management of physiological withdrawal, leading to severe, disastrous complications. The vast majority of people who suffer from withdrawal from benzodiazepines and non-benzodiazepines are dependent and not addicted. Due to this dependence, the process of withdrawing from long-term use of benzodiazepines and Z drugs for some people can be harrowing, painful, and debilitating, lasting months, even years. It's an experience no one truly understands who hasn't been there. Abrupt discontinuation of these drugs, stopping cold turkey, can lead to hallucinations, seizures, and even death. I am now five and a half years benzo-free, but I still have ongoing nerve damage from this experience and still experience an array of cognitive, emotional, and physical symptomology every day. Now, I'm not trying to frighten anyone here, I promise. That is the last thing I want to do. If you find yourself taking a benzodiazepine or non-benzodiazepine long-term, please don't panic. There is a huge community out there to help you, and a slow, tapered withdrawal can be managed and successful with proper education and medical supervision. Please visit our sister production, BenzoFree, at BenzoFree.org for more information if this is a concern for you. 
If you want to talk to me directly, fill out our feedback form at benzofree.org slash feedback. Unfortunately, the fact of physiological dependence is still little known in the general public and even in the medical community to some degree. Even though the American Psychiatric Association recognized physiological dependence from benzodiazepines as early as 1990. So, as for the pros and cons on this one, well, you might have guessed where I come down on this one, and you'd probably be right, I have to admit that. But the truth is, some psychiatric medications are effective for some people. But the potential benefits of any medication needs to be weighed against the possible side effects and long-term complications. Now, all that being said, I do want to remind everybody that I am not a medical professional. Anything provided on this video is for informational purposes only and should never be considered medical advice. Please, if you wish to start, stop, or make any changes in your medication, work with your doctor. And on a lighter note, <laughs> I sure hope, <laughs> let's go to our seventh tier, which is acceptance. This is the holy grail, in my opinion, of anxiety management tools. This is a complete change in your life, in how you look at the world. And that is accepting your anxiety, learning to live with your anxiety, learning to not fight your anxiety at every turn, but to accept it for what it is. I've had tastes of this. If taste is the right word, I don't really know. I just said that here. But I've experienced this in pieces throughout my recovery from benzos and just in my struggles with anxiety. I'm doing pretty good right now because I have found ways to live a better life. Acceptance is all about perspective or how you look at the world. How you see other human beings, how you relate to your family, your friends, neighbors and strangers. Acceptance is the seventh and final tier for two reasons. One, it's the hardest one to achieve and takes the most time. And two, it's the longest lasting by far and most effective of all anxiety management techniques. This is all about changing how you look at life. It's about finding acceptance and letting go of anger, control, and resentment. And it comes in many different forms depending on the person. For some, it's a cognitive change in the makeup of their neural net. For some, it's finding faith, a God to believe in and trust in. And for some, it's finding that inner confidence, that inner strength, that inner self that will guide you through hard times. But in the end, I think it's about three key components. Mindfulness, perspective, and spirituality. Mindfulness is not really complex. It's quite simple, actually, if you've never really experienced it or looked into it. It's about living in the moment, paying attention to the moment, and letting go of the desire to worry about what happened in the past or what is going to happen in the future. Meditation is a popular component of mindfulness and a great way to start practicing this technique. Perspective is the next one. It's about how you look at the world. Do you look at it through a positive mindset or through a negative mindset? Do you look at it through rose-colored glasses or smeared with fog and dirt and just nasty junk all over them? How you look at the world truly defines your attitude, your perspective, your outlook for life. And the final one is spirituality. For some, this means faith in a supreme being or God. For others, it might mean faith in the universe, the world, or even in our higher self which resides within us. Finding that reliance, that trust, that belief in something greater than ourselves can be the difference between a life of loss and a life of love. As for the pros and cons of this one, well, the cons, <laughs> that's kind of obvious. This can take a long time to achieve, a lifetime for some. And as for the pros, well, Clearly, every other tier we covered before this one are temporary. When we change our perspective of life, when we change our outlook on life, and we change the way that we see things, we change everything. Acceptance is about learning to make the most of what we have. It doesn't mean rolling over and accepting everything that's happening. You still strive to make changes. You still have dreams, and you can still try to achieve those. But it means that your entire happiness, your entire state of being, does not depend on its success. 
you're already okay. And you're going to get through whatever may come just fine. Well, I think that's going to wrap this up. Thanks for joining me today. I'm so glad that you watched this video and I hope you got something out of it. Please leave a comment on this video and let me know what you thought. I really want to hear your feedback, especially if you have certain things that have worked for you in the past or that haven't worked. Share those in the comments. Let us know and share those with other people who are watching. Be true, be kind, and be at peace. I'll see you next time. in future work that we do. Break. No, I'm not going to spend a lot of time. Break. No, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the break. No, I'm not going to break. One of the reasons I wanted to mention it, break. Do break. Come up and break. Long break. See that I think break. Ah. And break. His break. Oh, I kind of want to do this in sequence here. No, I'm not break. To sum up what Kierkegaard just said, break. The first tier, the first tier, the first tier. Hello, I'm here. And find ways of coping, managing, break. Acceptance is the set break. Do you have rose colored glass? Break. Break. Avoid break. Just be careful if you feel like break. Now one of the most common break. Now one of the most com break. Now one of the most common break. Now one of break. Now one of the most common method break. So so as for the pros and break. And on a lighter note, our seventh tier is break. I'm going to get through this. I know I'm going to say this eventually. Darren, you can get there straight enough. Okay. Oh, all right. And on a lighter again, like I mentioned before, this is masking tape, right? Never mind. I know that. I know that. I'm not going to do that again because I've done that before and I just get crazy sometimes. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, this one's taken a while to record and I'm getting a little. Okay. Straighten up. Flat back. Okay. Back down again. All right. Ah, uh, where the hell was I? <laughs> God, I do this. <laughs> See, I should not take a break because then I don't remember where I was.